common with Lynn was, in addition to training first in biology uh, and then later switching to a different career, uh, in between spending 10 years as a high school biology chemistry teacher. And we had a lot of interest in common in how uh, biology education materials get created and that sort of thing. Uh, it was sometimes hard when doing an oral history interview with her not to get sidetracked off onto these other interests. Uh, but they're all, in some sense, related. You become more reflective about the sciences, their development, how to teach them, and how to teach that development um, as part of the same process, I think. So as you heard, uh, I'm a historian of science. That means this is a historical talk. Uh, most of what I describe here happens between 1960 and 1981, uh, though near the end I'll mention some more recent happenings, and uh, since 2000, let's say, um, and I'll refer to some oral history interviews that I did with Lynn Margulis and Jim Lovelock a, a little over a decade ago in order to uh, look at some of their reflections looking back on the early history of the theories and uh, their reflections about some of the issues that I raised at the cultural moment in which these theories first uh, found their audiences. Uh, so it was once a little appreciated fact, I hope now it's somewhat more appreciated, that Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis underwent its initial gestation in the 1960s and continued through its adolescence in the 1970s as a spin-off of NASA's exobiology program. I'll explore here ways in which the search for life on other planets served as a useful incubator for the Gaia hypothesis. It also served as the intellectual soil and the sole source of financial support for over 30 years for the growth of Lynn Margulis' work on serial endosymbiosis theory, which she developed after 1971 in tandem with her collaboration with Lovelock on the Gaia idea. I'll argue here that the culture of the NASA exobiology program was a uniquely favorable environment during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, in which important work was funded that was far too interdisciplinary to receive funding from more traditional agencies such as National Institutes of Health or the National Science Foundation. I'll also discuss additional implications the theories were perceived to have because of the broader cultural moment in which they first appeared, a moment at which NASA's endeavors was an inseparable part. Uh, the origin of theories, like the origin of life or many of the other evolutionary events we've been hearing about, requires a suitable habitat, a context, often brought about at a particular place and time by contingent forces and events. NASA's Office of Life Sciences was created in 1960 and soon evolved into the Exobiology Program as one of its main branches. Uh, with the aim of searching for life on other planets. This also meant a lot of funding from NASA for research to origin of life researchers who were looking at how life originated on the Earth uh, to help determine what kind of conditions a planet would have to have in order to support the origin of life if it were not the Earth. Uh, NASA was soon moving quickly to recruit the best talent. Uh, I used this uh, Diego Rivera mural on the cover of my first book. And then when I did this uh, book on the history of the exobiology program at NASA, I found myself wishing that I had saved this image for that. It was the only piece of fine art that I know that has the origin of life as a central uh, theme. Uh, it lines the walls of a large water reservoir outside Mexico City, if you can see the sort of three-dimensionality of it. And those giant hands there with the water spilling out into the foreground are painted just above the main outlet where the main water pipe goes off to Mexico City. Um, and uh, as I thought of all the reasons why this would have been just as good or a better image for the second book, I thought of those hands as the hands of NASA spilling out funding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, Rivera, you know, a communist and an avowed atheist, I find it always kind of interesting that he used this incredibly Christian image in, in this mural, uh, but murals are public art, and I'm sure he knew that in the culture of Mexico. He could have uh, many different things going on with the use of this image. He may not have known that I was thinking years later that it could stand for NASA pouring money out. Uh, 
So NASA was soon moving quickly to recruit the best talent in instrumentation and basic science from all over the world. One man who combined both of these was a research chemist um, and to some extent a physiologist because of work that he had to do during the Second World War to get conscientious objector status, James Lovelock, who in 1957 had also developed a highly sensitive new device, the electron capture detector for gas chromatography. This device allowed trace, detection of trace organic molecules in the atmosphere down to the parts per trillion range for the first time. Uh, on May 9th, 1961, uh, he got a letter from NASA official Abe Silverstein inviting him to come to the U.S. to work on the development of the gas chromatograph for the Lunar Surveyor spacecraft at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Lovelock eagerly agreed. In his first NASA grant for $30,100, that's $30,1961, was awarded before the year's end and was channeled through the University of Houston, where a tenured professorship for him at Baylor College of Medicine was arranged with, as he put it, a dream salary of $20,000 per annum. <laughs> uh, he was to live in Houston with his family for two and a half years and commute regularly to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for much of the next 11 years. He continued to visit JPL periodically as a consultant until just before the launch of the two Viking Mars spacecraft in 1975. Because of ideas that he first developed on physical life detection experiments, in March 1965, Lovelock was also to put, put to work on an early Mars probe design called Voyager, among other things to develop the gas chromatograph as a life detection instrument. His description of the discussions between scientists and engineers is highly evocative of a heady sense of mission at JPL during the 1960s, as designing and launching probes to the moon and to the planets became a reality. Quote, as one whose childhood was illuminated by the writings of Jules Verne and Olaf Stapledon, I was delighted to have the chance of discussing at first hand plans for investigating Mars, end quote, he recalled some years later. As Lovelock describes it, the early meetings at JPL on life detection strategies for Mars probes had quickly settled into a rut. The strategies all sought to detect Earth-like microorganisms by immersing them in a liquid culture broth and then looking for their metabolic byproducts. This was true of a design of by the uh, biologist Wolf Vishniak, Gilbert Levin, an engineer, uh, and Vance Oyama, another biologist, all of whose designs eventually were accepted to fly on the Viking spacecraft to Mars in 1975, all had this basic strategy. Scoop up the Martian soil, of the appropriate term is regolith, since I think soil supposedly only applies to something that uh, definitely forms with the cooperation of living organisms. Scoop up some of the Martian regolith, dump it into a liquid nutrient broth, and then detect various different kinds of metabolic byproducts you'd expect from Earth-like microorganisms. Lovelock thought it was far too limiting to make such narrow, Earth-centric assumptions about potential Mars organisms. Challenged to come up with a more robust strategy to look for evidence of life, he argued that one ought to look for entropy reduction phenomena. When they said to him, all right, tell us how we could do that, <laughs> he had to think about it a few days, and then he suggested the most obvious activity of living things that offsets entropy was that they keep the gas composition of the planetary atmosphere far away from chemical equilibrium. For example, if a planet's atmosphere contains significant amounts of both methane and oxygen simultaneously for any length of time, Lovelock argued, this is so far from the equilibrium condition that it's strong presumptive evidence of life. Living things must be constantly replenishing two such reactive gases, or their levels would not remain high for long. By September 1965, the geneticist, Norman Horowitz, had become the new head of the biology division at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, a position he held until 1970, while still working part-time on the faculty at Caltech. As such, Horowitz came to oversee much of the planning of life detection experiments. Although Congress was not looking favorably at the Voyager mission, and in the end, the project was postponed so much by a congressional vote in December 1965 as to effectively kill it, Lovelock had published a paper by now on his thinking, 
and was on the verge of a powerful new insight. He realized that the gases living organisms most actively affect, especially carbon dioxide, methane, oxygen, water vapor, are just those gases that most dramatically shape the climate of the planet. He claims to have had a flash of insight one September day at JPL, in which he first wondered if living organisms might actively control the climate of the planet via feedback mechanisms to keep the conditions there favorable for their own survival and growth. Immediately blurting out his insight in discussions with Horowitz, Carl Sagan, and the philosopher Diane Hitchcock, he found them skeptical, but sufficiently in, uh, interested to encourage him in his thinking. Indeed, Hitchcock, a philosopher by training, had been collaborating on Lovelock's ideas about physical life detection for some months already. The two would eventually publish a paper on it together in Sagan's journal, Icarus. Horowitz, according to Lovelock, was, quote, open-minded, and although he disagreed with my views about the Earth and its atmosphere, he thought, as the good scientist he was, that they should be curbed, end quote. So Horowitz arranged for Lovelock to give a paper on his ideas at the American Astronautical Society, and he invited Lovelock to the second NASA conference on the origin of life to be held at Princeton in May 1968, where Lovelock, not coincidentally, first met Lynn Margulis. Lovelock found the reception of his ideas cool at the NASA meeting, with the exception of the Swedish specialist in the chemistry of the oceans, Lars Gunnar Sillen. He recalled that most of the older scientists at the meeting, especially the geologist uh, Preston Cloud, were quite unsympathetic to his concepts. Nonetheless, he worked steadily at the ideas, especially after 1971 when Lynn Margulis began to collaborate with him on the Gaia hypothesis. All the while, he continued as a consultant to JPL, largely on the design of other scientists' experiments. His and Horowitz's concerns notwithstanding, latest work on the versions, work on the latest versions of the Viking experiments that I've described before, all went ahead on continued NASA funding. So did development by Klaus Biemann, Juan Oro, and Leslie Orgel and their team of a gas chromat chromatograph and mass spectrometer to be sent to Mars to analyze organic compounds in the regolith or soil. Lovelock came up with the crucial means for hermetically linking the gas chromatograph to the mass spectrometer when, when those instruments eventually were sent to Mars on the Viking spacecraft, the next iteration of design after Congress finally definitively canceled the earlier Voyager design in the wake of summer 1967 race riots in many US cities. Uh, that summer, you found particularly little sympathy among a lot of voters for spending a lot of money on Mars when we didn't seem to know how to keep the uh, United States from burning. Uh, Lovelock later called the new field that was spawned by the guy the hypothesis geophysiology. In a later description, uh, he, he described it thus. It arose during attempts to, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not on the slide yet. Uh, it arose during attempts to design experiments to detect life on other planets, particularly Mars. For the most part, these experiments were geocentric and based on the notion of landing an automated biological or biochemical laboratory on the planet. Hitchcock and Lovelock took the opposing view that not only were such experiments likely to fail because of their egocentricity, his word, uh, but also that there was a more certain way of detecting planetary life, whatever its form might be. Uh, this would be uh, an approach to life detection from a systems view of planetary life. In particular, suggesting that if life can be taken to constitute a global entity, its presence would be revealed by a change in the chemical composition of the planet's atmosphere. And many of these observations, if the planet were close enough, you could make from the Earth with spectroscopy and optical telescopes. Uh, certainly on a planet such as Mars, it was uh, the composition of the atmosphere was already recognized to be something that was basically at chemical equilibrium. Because of the state of chemical equilibrium in the atmospheres of both Mars and Venus, Lovelock predicted from the very first guy of insight in 1965 that both planets must be lifeless. Consequently, he was skeptical about the large expenditures on the Viking biology instruments, above and beyond his earlier skepticism about the conceptual basis of the instruments, now thinking the money could be much better spent on other measurements on Mars. 
uh, Viking ended up costing something like $2 billion in 1975 dollars. Uh, but now, an additional and much deeper insight dawned on Lovelock. Given the so-called faint young, young sun paradox, the fact that the biota was so actively shaping the chemical environment of the biosphere, including the atmosphere, took on new explanatory power. <laughs> the sun had been cooler, as much as 30% cooler, at the time when life first originated on Earth. Yet during the entire three and a half billion years or so since life had appeared, it seemed clear that the Earth's surface temperature could not have varied by nearly <coughs> as much as the 30% from the present values. Living things couldn't have survived and proliferated if Earth had been that much cooler then than at present, or if it had been at this temperature then, it couldn't possibly remain at anything close to this temperature now if it were a non-living planet. Either the Earth had been warmer than it should have been at the origin of life, or more likely living things were regulating the temperature so that modern temperatures were cooler relative to how much the sun had warmed than they would have been on a lifeless planet. Since the main means of regulating the Earth's surface temperature known at that time was by the so-called greenhouse effect, dependent on gases given off and consumed by living organisms, carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, among others, it didn't seem impossible that the biota could regulate planetary temperature, decreasing the greenhouse effect slowly over eons to compensate for the increasing heat of the sun. Later, it turned out the biota also regulates cloud formation and thus dramatically alters the amount of incoming solar energy reflected back to space as another powerful way of regulating temperature. Perhaps, Lovelock began to think, the biota acted as a cybernetic system that regulated temperature, pH, oxygen level, many other parameters in just such a way as to maintain conditions on Earth suitable for the survival of life. As mentioned above, Lovelock's idea was at first received quite coolly by the scientific community, even at a 1968 NASA-sponsored Origin of Life meeting, where interdisciplinary thinking was the norm. It was so much the norm that a psychiatrist, uh, Frank Fremont Smith, and an ethologist, Saul Kramer, were both re-invited, having been at the previous year's meeting as well. And there was much talk at this meeting of the Origin of Life being an epistemological problem as much as a scientific one invoking Marshall McLuhan's recent slogan that the medium is the message. Again, think of the cultural moment when this is occurring. Kramer uh, described first getting interested in origin of life problems while studying in a course on cancer taught by a famed psychoanalyst turned natural scientist, Wilhelm Reich. Lewis Thomas, author of Lives of a Cell and numerous other popular science works, took an early and sympathetic interest both in the Gaia hypothesis and in Margulis's serial endosymbiosis hypothesis. He wrote favorably on both theories, but he was quite the exception to the rule at a time well before either of them had become more widely accepted. Back to NASA, though Norm Horowitz, the geneticist, was not a fan of the Gaia hypothesis, he agreed with a number of Lovelock's views. Uh, Lovelock shared Horowitz's feeling, for example, that sterilizing Martian landers was unnecessary, saying, the concept of contaminating a virginal Mars with Earth life seemed the stuff of fanatics, not scientists, and the act of sterilization hazarded the delicate and intricate instruments that we wanted to send to Mars. This view was opposed by Carl Sagan, Elliot Leventhal, and Joshua Lederberg. In a more piquant passage, Lovelock described his view of life detection experiments as follows. The engineering and physical sciences of the NASA institutions, he said, was often so competent as to achieve an exquisite beauty of its own. By contrast, with some very notable exceptions, the quality of the life sciences was primitive and steeped in ignorance. The very interdisciplinary part of NASA that has given him funding at a time when he might perhaps not have found a funding audience elsewhere, seems to him really quite primitive in scientific thinking. Uh, it's almost as if a group of the finest engineers were asked to design an automatic roving vehicle which would cross the Sahara Desert. But then when they'd done this, they were required to design an automatic fishing rod and a line to mount on the vehicle to catch the fish that swam among the sand and 
think about what Mariner photographs coming back from Mars in 1965 were already showing about the nature of the planet that, that you know, was very much in some sense like the dune planet that we heard about earlier this morning. Uh, those patient engineers were also expected to design their vehicle so as to withstand the temperatures needed to sterilize it, for otherwise the dunes might be infected with fish-destroying microorganisms. <laughs> As somebody noted yesterday, Lovelock had a flair for rhetoric. Mm -hmm. But Horowitz and Lovelock also felt that the other instruments designed for the Viking all shared the basic flaw of assuming that Martian microbes, even if they did exist, would do well in a wet environment, since all those designs involved saturating the Martian soil with some kind of a liquid broth of nutrients. In Horowitz's way of thinking, this produced conditions wildly unlike those of Mars. He thought so still more after July 1965 when the Mariner 4 space probe showed Mars to be a cratered, dry planet. Even President Lyndon Johnson, after looking at the Mariner 4 photos, concluded that, quote, life as we know it with its humanity is more unique than many of us have thought, end quote. Mariner 4 led Carl Sagan in his enthusiasm for the possibility of life, to observe that satellite photographs taken from 6,000 miles above the Earth also showed no signs of life. Interestingly, when the Galileo spacecraft tested this proposition out by observing Earth in 1993, Sagan was proven wrong, and he admitted as much in an article in Nature at the time. Lovelock recalled, quote, I remember well that Nature article by Carl. He was having to eat his words, and it showed. Sometime earlier, he had written that the only signs of life on Earth that could be seen from space was the clear cutting of forests in Canada, end quote. Mariner's measurements, uh, the spacecraft made of the Martian atmosphere, found that it was much thinner than had been previously supposed. Uh, the pressure of the air was too low for any liquid water to exist at the planet's surface. CO2 was its major component with only a trace of water vapor, recalled Horowitz. Quote, that discovery gave me and my collaborators, George Hobby and Jerry Hubbard, the impetus to design a different kind of instrument that would search for life on a dry planet. That instrument was called the Pyrolytic Release Experiment. I never applied to NASA for funding to develop the experiment since the funds were provided by JPL, uh, which might as well have been NASA since it was essentially an arm of the space agency. Because of the Mariner 4 results, Horowitz was among those who proposed that Antarctica, Antarctica uh, specifically the very coldest, driest desert valleys there, was a better analog for Mars than most other sites on Earth. Yet even those, he said, were overwhelmingly hospitable places for life compared to the Martian environment. Horowitz and his collaborators Roy Cameron and Jerry Hubbard began to study the microbiology of the driest and most inhospitable parts of Antarctica, to understand whether life could survive there at all. They later claimed to have found some of the only naturally sterile soils on the Earth, about 14% of their samples from these valleys, claiming this made life on Mars still less probable than previously thought, and proving that sterilizing spacecraft to be sent to Mars was pointless, since conditions there were so much harsher than those sufficient to render some Antarctic uh, soils totally sterile. Uh, in the event, uh, as you may know, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, signed by the United States and quite a few other nations, did require sterilizing spacecraft up to a certain level, uh, regardless of the theoretical discussions at NASA at the time. Uh, apparently, political leaders saw it as far more persuasive that it was important to sign on, um, even if there was not scientific consensus on the topic of how useful it was. While he recognized that the interdisciplinary environment of NASA's exobiology program had been favorable in some ways for a hypothesis as potentially paradigm-changing as Gaia and for serial endosymbiosis theory, Lovelock was also aware that many in the scientific community looked askance at NASA-funded science and thought it was of lower quality, especially in the life sciences, than work funded by NSF, NIH, or other government agencies. This created more than a little ambivalence toward his new patron. Lovelock may even have shared his opinion of some exobiology-funded research 
As he expressed it to Margulis in a letter early in 1973, lamenting the difficulty they were having finding a journal that would accept their paper on Gaia, quote, it does seem to have a pity to have both of our babies fostered by exobiology, which in my classification is just one notch above psychic research, end quote. Microbiologist and cell biologist Lynn Margulis collaborated with Lovelock on two major theoretical papers developing the Gaia idea in 1974. Lovelock also presented a paper on the topic to a meeting of the Royal Society of London that was devoted to extraterrestrial life. The theory received a fairly cool treatment from the scientific community, however, just as it had at NASA. More thoughts below on why this was so. However, the first important breakthrough, you could say, occurred uh, in a meeting in 19 to 20 June, 1979, when a major exobiology meeting was convened at NASA Ames Research Center in California. With all the new data pouring in by the late 1970s from Viking, from Lowe's recognition of the archaea, the discovery of thriving biotic communities at deep sea hydrothermal vents, etc., John Billingham of NASA Ames saw a need to reconsider the big questions, both in origin of life research, what was known of conditions relevant to life on other planets, uh, con uh, considerations pertinent to SETI, etc. As a result, he arranged the Conference on Life in the Universe in June 1979. Since the Viking results had so strikingly borne out Lovelock's prediction that Mars would be lifeless based on its atmospheric chemistry, Lovelock and Margulis and their Gaia hypothesis got a prominent place on the agenda at Billingham's meeting. This was a crucial turning point for the theory. Not only was it being given a high-profile podium just at the time that Lovelock's first book on Gaia was about to appear, perhaps just as important was that Stephen Schneider, a leading atmospheric researcher from the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, was at the meeting and was much impressed by the potential power of the Gaia hypothesis. <coughs> it was Schneider who critically addressed the idea and its promise in a 1984 mass market book, The Co-Evolution of Climate and Life, and in a television documentary produced in 1985 by the BBC's Horizon and the America Nova series. Uh, you can find that documentary on YouTube, by the way, in six parts. I've, ever since 1985, I've been trying to get a copy of that documentary to show to my classes when we discussed the data hypothesis, and it was completely unavailable. You could get almost any Nova show in the history of the show except that one. But somebody somewhere, apparently had a copy of it and posted it in six parts on YouTube, so now everybody can find it. In addition, Schneider, along with Penelope Boston, organized the first major conference to evaluate the scientific merit of the Gaia hypothesis under the auspices of the American Geophysical Union in March 1988, after which the journal Science described the outcome under the headline, No Longer Willful, Gaia Becomes Respectable. Earlier, in a series of meetings at NASA Ames, also uh, 1981 to 82, also convened by Billingham, and this time by David Rao, on the evolution of complex and higher organisms, the participants reached the following major conclusion, quote, of special interest is the controversial Gaia hypothesis, which proposes that living things have prevented drastic climate changes on the Earth throughout most of its history. This view, regarded as highly speculative and tentative by many workers, has yet to be rigorously examined. If it proves to be correct, and if climatic stabilization can be shown to be a likely consequence of the activities on life, of life on other worlds as well, then we may expect that extraterrestrial life is abundant throughout the universe. An effort should be made, therefore, to determine whether the Gaia hypothesis is valid." End quote. So given its potential fruitfulness, recognized no later than this time, 1981 to 82, it's a fascinating phenomenon worthy of study just how much resistance Gaia generated in the geology, atmospheric science, climatology, and evolutionary biology communities. Charles Darwin had some good rhetorical reasons for clinging so tenaciously to his term natural selection despite intense criticism by many, that this implied an anthropomorphic, voluntaristic selector in nature. 
And in a story with some interesting parallels, Lovelock's term Gaia was attacked from the beginning, and the same charges were brought. It's anthropomorphic, no matter how many times he said, I meant it as a metaphor. You're assigning agency to a natural process, and therefore secretly slipping some kind of supernatural power in through the back door, etc., etc. Uh, for those of you who might not realize that this was uh, part of the response to Darwin's first announcement of the theory of natural selection, that many people almost willfully misread what he meant by selection, um, I would commend to you uh, Robert Young's book called Darwin's Metaphor. Uh, interestingly, ironically, this time, it's the hardline natural selectionists for Doolittle, Richard Dawkins, John Maynard Smith, William Hamilton, who attacked the metaphor for having voluntarist overtones, although they themselves had worked hard to press the selfish gene metaphor to supplement the natural selection of their revered ancestor. Uh, from the first, the key technical criticism was how behavior by a microorganism that benefited the biosphere as a whole, but not itself individually, and might sometimes even be detrimental to its own survival, such as the first release of oxygen in a world dominated by anaerobes, uh, could ever evolve and persist by natural selection. And Lovelock acknowledges that early versions of the theory, up through his 1979 book, Gaia, A New Look at Life on Earth, suffered from an inadequate consideration of this question. He developed the Daisy World mathematical model in collaboration with Andrew, Red, Andrew uh, uh, Watson of Reading University to answer these questions. He discusses this model at length in his uh, second 1988 book, The Ages of Gaia. The hypothesis, as I said above, was scrutinized further at the 1981-82 NASA workshop on the uh, evolution of complex and higher organisms, ECHO, they uh, abbreviated as. Participants who found the, the hypothesis intriguing said, quote, although many of us are skeptical, we agree that the Gaia mechanism approaches one extreme of a spectrum of possibilities, ranging from total control of a planet's environment by its organisms to total lack of control, and that much further study is needed to determine the causes of large-scale environmental stability and change. The Gaia hypothesis in particular could be investigated by seeking to identify evolutionary mechanisms, if any such exist, that are capable of selecting organisms whose activities promote global environmental stability." End quote. A key intellectual barrier was surely the idea in geology, evolutionary biology, and environmental science that the environment changes and affects organisms, but that organisms themselves were mostly passive recipients of such selective forces. For most, it required a very deep reconceptualization to see living organisms as potent forces shaping conditions on Earth just as powerfully, perhaps more so, as they were being shaped by those external conditions. And we heard a lot about that same kind of mental barrier in Jim Shapiro's talk uh, just before lunch. Uh, but in addition, the name Gaia drew a great deal of fire, first suggesting via the image of the ancient Greek Earth goddess, everything from vague, vague New Age mysticism to teleology re-imported into biology <laughs> after a 150-year struggle by evolutionary biology to banish it. The first sharp critique in this vein was by W. Ford Doolittle called Is Nature Really Motherly? Published in Coevolution Quarterly in spring 1981. Then came Richard Dawkins' The Blind Watchmaker in 1984. Quite a bit of this criticism is summed up in science by Charles Mann in a piece titled Lynn Margulis, Science's Unruly Earth Mother. <laughs> the title tells the story. The tone used by critics such as John Maynard Smith and Fort Doolittle is rather more harsh and dismissive than is typical for a scholarly scientific exchange. In the ensuing Take No Prisoners firefight, Lovelock made some modifications to his theory to reflect the valid points that his critics had driven home. For example, he acknowledged that his original formulation, that living organisms coordinated Gaia to keep conditions on Earth <coughs> ideal for their own survival, was untenable, and indeed teleological. He now says Gaia has acted to maintain conditions merely within the bounds of what life can tolerate, 
but need not necessarily continue doing so if human perturbations become too extreme. Exobiology, and more recently it has turned into, developed into the larger project called astrobiology, after the disappointment of Viking, has fully incorporated Lovelock's insight, although usually without attribution, that life detection strategies need, insofar as possible, to be non-Earth-centric. After the modifications of the theory as presented in Lovelock's second book in 1988, more in the exobiology community found Lovelock's theory acceptable. Harold Morowitz, for example, at uh, George Mason University wrote, the orig that origin of life researchers now needed to understand that in Lovelock's sense, life is a property of plants rather than of individual organisms. Uh, this view was complementary rather than opposed to the traditional view in biology that sought to define life by comparing what all living organisms have in common. Indeed, under the new name, Earth System Science, the core of the modified Gaia theory has now become mainstream science in much of geoscience, and I chair a department of Earth and Environment where two of the professors who work have written a textbook called Earth System Science, in which they say to me quite plainly, yeah, we've used most of what Lovelock was talking about in the 1970s, once he corrected it in the 1980s, but we're never going to call it Gaia. Uh, Lovelock, however, tenaciously def defends the name Gaia. He insists that names are important. Uh, and describing one striking episode, he says, I stuck with the name Gaia because my green friends and quite a few scientists regarded a change of name as a betrayal, and so do I. I did try the neologism geophysiology for scientists, and it worked for a while, until the snarling dogs realized it was just another name for God. <laughs> I overheard a distinguished scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research say to a young scientist, I will not have you use the word geophysiology. It's just <laughs> closet Gaia. <laughs> and he went on to say, in Mary Mitchell's book, Science and Poetry, she deals in full with the name Gaia, <coughs> why it was rejected by so many scientists. A great deal of the fuss over Gaia is because I work as an independent, that is, not at a university in any academic department. And I only rarely go to the meetings of scientists. It's hard to appreciate the work of someone you don't know. Uh, anybody familiar with Lovelock's work uh, probably knows that he wrote a lengthy defense of being an independent scientist in 1979 and warned the young scientists in training be careful, don't get involved in the academic career track if you really ever hope to have big, overarching new ideas. Because the very nature of the tenure process, the peer review process, the grant review process, will beat those new ideas out of you. 